All right. I think we will get started just in the interest of time um, as people rolling in. Um, I'm very excited to see my high school orchestra teacher here, Mr. Edmonds. Thanks for joining. That's just so exciting. I haven't seen you in years and it's such a joy to see you. Um, that's really cool. Well, welcome everybody to um, the uh, Chicago Arts Partnerships in Education, CAPE presents events, musicians and music educators in dialogue. My name is Joseph Spielberg. I'm the Associate Director of Education at CAPE. And uh, before we get started with this, I just wanna do a really quick introduction. I'm gonna share my screen, um, tell you a little bit about um, how we got to here and who we are and that sort of thing. So um, this is our website, um, capechicago.org. Um, and our mission at CAPE is uh, to engage students, inspire teachers, and demonstrate impact by weaving visual, digital, and performing arts into classrooms across Chicago. Um, and we've done this for over 25 years in Chicago, working with uh, artists and partnering them with Chicago Public School teachers and working in some other districts as well. And we really enjoyed that work, but as you know, then there was a, a pandemic. So things changed um, and, and honestly, um, uh, like I'm sure all of us, you know, we didn't know exactly what to do. So um, uh, we really decided to rely on our strongest assets in this scenario and come together, uh, reach out to and come together uh, with our teachers and artists that we work with as a network. And so in response to the pandemic, <coughs> we, um, we started to dialogue in earnest with our teachers and artists. And this took the form of the CAPE Network Forum. And uh, you can see this here on the screen now, hopefully. Um, the CAPE, CAPE Network Forum is a place for CAPE teachers, artists, and program staff members to share ideas, questions, reflections, and video instructions. As a network, our inquiry questions are, how can remote learning be inquiry-based and collaborative, uh, artistically and pedagogically? How can remote learning work towards unknown results that can uh, still be publicly shared for further dialogue and questioning. Um, special shout out to Jenny Lee for uh, putting together this website here at CAPE, um, this Tumblr page, uh, but you can see the rest of the staff there, Mark Diaz, myself, Brandon, and uh, Scott Sick, our, our education director. And so this is a, a great resource. I, I hope that you all can uh, take time to check, check out the CAPE Chicago Tumblr page. And what you're gonna see are just hundreds of projects, reflections, thought pieces, uh, student work, teacher planning and dialogue. That's, uh, that's just a really interesting resource. And this, this uh, coming together of our network um, really inspired us to, uh, to go further in dialogue. And we started reaching uh, outside of our, our own uh, uh, network of teachers and artists. And that's where these uh, CAPE Present series started from. So we've already had two um, CAPE uh, presents events, both uh, were artist-centric. So we had two events that uh, involved uh, specifically artists in dialogue. And this event, um, we actually had several of our CAPE teachers and artists that worked in uh, music disciplines who expressed that, um, you know, it'd be great to have the music perspective because a lot of uh, the previous two events were visual arts based. Um, I also have a background in music, so I was excited about that idea. And my boss, um, our education director, Scott Sikama, really uh, uh, um, encouraged me to, to take it on. It was, you know, it was a direct order. I couldn't really debate it with him. Um, but I appreciate that he did. Um, and that led us to reach out to other organizations around Chicago and individual artists that we work with here in Chicago um, to uh, put this out there. Um, and I would like to set also a special thank you to YA National for helping us get the word out. Uh, NAFME, N-A-F-M-E, and the uh, I-L-M-E-A, Illinois Music Educators Association, also for helping us get the, work, uh, uh, get the word out there. Um, it's really exciting to see such a great turnout for this topic. Um, I wanted to uh, also, uh, let you know that we're going to have each presenter present and uh, we'll do those right in a row. 
If you have questions, feel free to write them in the chat at any time and we will get to the chat towards the end. We'll hopefully have a good half hour to work uh, and to discuss and work through questions and uh, have more of an open dialogue amongst the presenters. And then um, I would also like to everybody know this recording, including the Herp Alpert introduction, um, was uh, recorded and will be recorded and we plan to share it publicly. So if you're not comfortable with that, that's understandable. Um, but just so you know that we are planning to share this recording publicly. Um, again, I want to uh, plug the CAPE uh, Network Forum. This is uh, capechicago.com. It's, it's a Tumblr page, um, but also a great resource for you to use. I also want to plug quickly, um, if you are a Chicago-based uh, music educator, CAPE is partnering with DCASE, the Chicago, City of Chicago Department of Cultural Fairs and special events to put together um, a series of youth exchange events across the city. And we're partnering up uh, different ensembles of different musical genres to uh, simply share with each other what they're working online. And we're hoping to bring together students um, that live in very different neighborhoods in the city who wouldn't normally interact because of invisible boundaries that we have in Chicago. Uh, to hopefully bring them together through music. So we're very excited to be a part of this partnership with DK do so. And um, I'm going to, this, this link is terribly long, but I'm going to quickly write in the chat box. Actually, Jenny, can I ask you to write? It's bit.ly.com slash all capitals, Y-O-C-M capital E for exchange, Y-O-C-M exchange. And that stands for Year of Chicago Music Exchange, because this is still the Year of Chicago Music uh, as DCASE is celebrating it, and we want to keep the positivity around what's possible with youth and music. And that's really what today is about, too. Um, so uh, we hope that you do enjoy this presentation. There's some really excellent presenters, and I'm really excited to introduce them all. Um, so as we had in our um, Eventbrite page, uh, we will be hearing from, in this order, I'll just, we'll go with this order, John Foster first from the Jazz Institute of Chicago, Lionel Brother L. Freeman uh, of the Beat Bank, also a Cape Teaching Arts, also uh, uh, artists at large. John Connect, an interdisciplinary artist, also works with Cape and many other organizations. Rachel Maxwell, who is a music teacher from Oswego, Illinois, and Ann Kuhn McTeague and Carrie Mari from Chicago Youth Symphony Orchestras. Um, and before I do this, I just want to do one last thing and then I'm going to turn it over to John. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. So John, if you want to get ready to go, just a quick thing. We had such an interesting uh, turnout today that we didn't really expect. Um, I just wondered if folks could, um, we're going to do a little survey at the end, but if you can quickly write down in the chat, if you're from out of Illinois, what city and state you're from. And if you're from out of Chicago, write down what uh, city in Illinois you are from. And I think that would be fun to see in the chat uh, as we get going here. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, John. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is John Foster. I work at the Jazz Institute of Chicago. I'm the education manager as well as the student council coordinator. So. We deal a lot with educational program in jazz throughout the city, not only within the schools, but we also have a bunch of programs that we conduct um, elsewhere. Uh, we have our residency program where we send a master resident artist to the schools and they get eight free weeks free of charge to the school uh, with a resident artist uh, to work with their students alongside with their uh, band director that they have at school. We also have a jazz links jam session that was conducting at the jazz showcase that happened every second Wednesday. Um, and we also have the Jazz Link Student Council, which is basically a council full of kids uh, ages from sixth grade all the way up until uh, I until senior year in college. And then we still have keep in touch with our alumni and it's not limited to anybody. So you can live in the Chicago metropolitan area and the students can join that uh, program. 
Um, and then we also have a host of other different public programs, like our Jazz City program, where we actually take concerts and put them in the parks in different neighborhoods, and we go to that neighborhood. So essentially, we bring the music to you. Um, so uh, as we're all here today, um, we're all obviously here to talk about what are some of the things that we've been doing to kind of compensate with the whole COVID-19 thing where we're not really in contact with each other anymore. Um, I can tell you for the Institute, our motto ever since this COVID-19 uh, thing has happened is to keep the music playing, literally. Keep the music playing, keep moving, um, finding different ways to keep everybody engaged and into the music that it is uh, via our social medias, um, we also had a jazz camp that we just completed, which is the first time we've ever did something as big as this, where we took a jazz camp and it's almost kind of like similar to a conference and we took it and we put it online. The whole thing, um, you was able to sign up. Uh, unfortunately, our registration is closed now, but the cool thing about it was we had uh, people that usually when we have the camp, we have it in partnership with Columbia College at Columbia College and participants of the camp come every single day to Columbia College and uh, participate with the different guest artists we bring in. Uh, this year we had Sean Jones, phenomenal, uh, Dana Hall, who is a Chicago staple, and Tia Fuller. And what was the first thing, the first thing that we hurdled that we had to come over was how can we still produce the content for that program? Um, thankfully, we teamed up with a, a production company and they took care of all the heavy lifting for us as far as like trying to get everything online and running the whole camp. Man, they were phenomenal. It, without them, we it would have been very hard to just do all that work by ourselves. But the camp, the camp attendees really loved it. They so far have been very approved, approving of it. And they still have that content to go back and relate to over I think until August next week, the end of next week. Usually they, with the regular camp, we don't have any like materials that they can go back to as far as videos and stuff that they can read, go over. But with this camp, that's one of the big main benefits of it. Uh, as far as our kids with the student council, uh, what I've been doing with the student council was kind of uh, a big thing where we were trying to figure out how to get them more involved, but the one thing that it did open up a lot more was that I could, I had more access to uh, people that I never really had access to because we were in the virtual state. So it was a couple of people like alumni of the program, uh, Marquis Hill, which some of you might know or might not know. Usually he's always in tour or usually he's like in another part of the uh, country or part of the world for that matter, because he's a very, uh, in demand musician right now and uh, very uh, prominent at, at what he's doing. And it was always hard to try and like set up a time for him to speak to the kids, seeing as he's an alumni of the program and all the kids in the program know about Marquise. They love Marquise. They listen to his music constantly. So what I've made it a theme, we have these things called Jazzly Student Council meetings, which were, they were very, very, uh, I, want to say, I don't want to say sporadic, but they were always next to each other where they, we basically met, I want to say every other week. It was, we went along with the uh, Logan Center and the Symphony Center concert uh, dates where after the Symphony Center concert, they got to speak to the artists that were playing at the Symphony Center as well as the Logan Center. Um, but with, because of COVID, we didn't have those resources available. So what I was doing was I was, getting different artists from all over the world to come into the Zoom meetings that we had to talk to them about either some projects or stuff that they were going on. Um, so I got Marquise to come in and I actually, we actually took it a step further. One of the things uh, also that we have at this institute with the student council is this thing called the Emerging Artist Program, which is a program we started uh, to basically enhance and enhance creativity as well as uh, promote leadership within the student council. So we want to we want to promote these uh, students as much as possible to become the next leaders and next creators and next performers that you see on these stages and festivals coming up and everything. So um, that that partnership with that program is usually done through the William Harris Lee Violin Shop that's in the Fine Arts Building, which has a phenomenal space in the front that we partner with, and usually. What we do is all the students have to go through this um, 
they have to go through this application process is almost similar to applying for a regular jazz festival uh, gig where they have to submit their bios, they have to submit a picture, they have to set up a social media for their bands. And the whole premises of the whole program is to have them set up their own concert so they can build their audience themselves of their peers. So it was really, it's starting to, we started this program, I want to say three years ago. Um, and since then it's been growing big. Uh, we actually, furthered our partnership not only with William Harris Lee but we also do it at uh, Navy Pier every year this year we I think we was lucky enough to still able to do our partnership with them with the Emerging Artists Project but not in the sense since that we usually do it so to kind of compensate for that what we've been doing is all the student council kids have been uh, given a project where I challenge them to come up with uh, different songs and different things to come to do uh, with digital audio workstations because um, we really feel that working in a techn technological age that a lot of a lot of these students are going to have to musically inclined are going to have to learn how a digital audio workstation works so we started bringing in more people to talk to them about digital audio workstations in our student council meetings and then we came up with a whole project where everybody had to submit a different recording uh, based off of what was going on with every single track in. So I'm going to play a little bit of snippet of what the student council kids came up with. And one of the things that really good about the student council is that they are really, they really take it uh, as their own and we just provide what we can for them. So one of the things that they asked for was that they want a marquise on the track and they didn't think it was gonna happen, but we actually made it happen. So you will hear a trumpet, which is Marquise who added a little bit to it. Uh, what you can see is actually the layout of how they had it. I just have the copy on my end, but here, I'm gonna play it without talking more. So because they're not together so much, uh, it was it actually sounds like they were actually in the same room together. It's just that they were able to bring all this stuff together and submit their uh submit their individual uh soundtracks and then they just layered in on top of each other. It, this is actually supposed to be this is like incomplete as of right now. I challenge them to not only make the video but uh, uh the audio, but they have to make a video with it too. So uh be looking at, at the Jazz Institute's social medias for that coming up soon. Uh with the straight with our jam sessions that usually happen at the jazz showcase every second Wednesdays, we actually because we couldn't do that, we actually moved that as well to uh, online videos that we share shared every second Wednesday when the actual jam session was supposed to happen. So everybody in the house band was gave basically like a whole like uh, I want to say like a 25 minute uh, tutorial on their choice of what they wanted students to still work on as far as like attending a regular jam session. And I'm gonna play you a little clip of that. Uh, so this, here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> Here is here talking to you live from my living room. Man, sucks that I don't get to see you all at the jazz showcase for our monthly jam sessions, but we can still learn something even though we're using technology. Welcome to the new world. So, a tune I like to hear most people write down that I don't see students write so much down is playing a blues at our jam sessions. We could talk about a blues in a simple format of 12 bars, and that 12 bar phrase 
would really only utilize three different scale slash chords. Numerically speaking, they'd be the one, the four, and the five. The first four bars would all be based off of the one chord. So we have a bunch of bunch of videos up, uh, and we're once we get back in the season, we're going to start that back up as well. Um, and then I'm going to end it off with just a little snippet of what we did at Navy Pier. So we were still able to work out with Navy Pier because they work outside some of our Emerging Artist Project, which feature uh, our current student council member, Devin Shaw, and then our alumni student council member, Jahari Stampley. Um, and it was very interesting what, it, what it's going to be like going forward as far as public performances uh, during a COVID state, as far as with this whole having them wear masks, people six feet apart and everything. Um, but we still got it done. Um, I'm going to just play a little clip of it for you all. And then that will actually conclude my whole thing. Let me see. <laughs> Yeah, so that's pretty much what we've been doing at the Jazz Institute. We've really been trying to stay with the curve of tech moving into a techno technological realm. And one thing that we've been trying to tell the students is that even though everything is going through virtually right now, there are still ways that we can uh, incorporate digital audio workstations into our live performances once we come out of this thing. Um, and it'd be very interesting to see which students take that and go forth with it because music is always ever changing. And we're always, uh, we can either go with it or we can just leave it as it is. But I really wanna see what evolution that we get out of this era of virtual. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, John. Thanks Thank for sharing. you. Um, all right. I uh, would love to uh, welcome Lionel to present next. Brother Elf, thank you for joining us. Greetings, greetings, everyone. My name is Lionel, Brother Elf Freeman. I'm a spontaneous composer, multidisciplinary creative, audio engineer, and educator who uses visual and music to express ideas while connecting people to a higher plane of consciousness. <clears throat> so my artistic practice dwells within the convergence of arts and wellness. I'm specifically interested in new media technologies that allow <clears throat> underserved communities to access what would be valuable as liberatory practices. Um, I've worked in audio production for over 20 years. And my mission uh, encompasses highlighting live PA, which is uh, electronic music for live performance, uh, experimental electronic music, arts equity, community wellness, and other progressive musics while activating spaces for artists to perform and develop their art uh, for purposes of inspiration and healing. You know, so what, what is my work? Uh, I've composed, mixed, recorded many albums in hip hop and electronic music uh, for my company, The Beat Bank. Uh, I've developed a teaching artist practice, uh, which uh, I'm working with CAPE and uh, some other arts organizations. Uh, uh, my residency with CAPE is at Diet High School. <clears throat> I uh, create two annual events celebrating electronic music. Uh, one is called the Live PA Institute Day, and that's held annually at University of Chicago. And the other one is called uh, the Sandbox Symphony. Uh, the <clears throat> Live PA Institute Day is a free one-day conference that uh, Chicago-based electronic music musicians use to cultivate and craft and build the community around electronic music. Because uh, we don't really have I shouldn't say we don't really have, we're making it. Uh, we're making a, a stronger community of working artists, you know, uh, around electronic music <clears throat> here in Chicago. The Sandbox Symphony is uh, kind of my, 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 my event that I'm really passionate about. 
Um, it is a symphony of art activations on the physical beach, uh, visual, um, pre uh, pre preparatory, uh, <clears throat> and uh, it happens yearly. And that's one of the things that uh, we've had to think about remixing uh, going forward, obviously, for uh, reasons of pandemic expression. Uh, and another thing that uh, I'm doing, it, uh, I'm, I'm writing a cookbook, but it's a, it's a vegan cookbook and sound design breakbeat album. And the pairing of food and music uh, is not necessarily a unique idea, but the way I'm approaching it is uh, pairing the food for healing and music for healing. So tones and frequencies that uh, make the body feel a certain way, uh, foods that enhance certain, you know, function, body functions. I'm pairing those things together with meals that <clears throat> we can we can make in 30 minutes or 40 minutes, so that like it's really accessible for, for people, you know, who don't really consider themselves chefs but really would like to eat well. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about my work specifically at diet and over the summer what we've been doing we've been actually working on making beats but we've been making loop based beats uh with a looper a looper a digital looper that's on ios devices and uh, android and the challenge has been to utilize the environment that you have this room or wherever you are uh <clears throat> around your home to come up with ways to make sound uh you know not just from an instrument per se but from things around you that make sense that could be transformed so the general idea is to transform the space that you have within and so we we do that and part of it uh part of the challenge and i think that we all face this challenge is is a, a teaching artist is engagement, you know, keeping people, young people <laughs> in particular, interested in what you're doing and what interested in what they're doing. Um, and so I've come up with an equation that I've been approaching to kind of rally and um, kind of soothe or solve that problem of engagement. Uh, I don't have the answers, but the equation is like this. How can we be as physical as possible within this virtual environment? So, you know, looking at the screen all day, you know, for different classes, hard sciences and, and the like, you know, could get very boring for, for most, you know, and so I try to remix how that really works, you know. So sometimes we take walks, you know, uh, with our cell phones around the neighborhood environments. We share things that, you know, um, are important to us. And those things end up in our music, you know, those experiences that we talk about. Um, and then <clears throat> also I like to share the classroom aesthetic to the young people. So, you know, they become the teachers as well, uh, based on what we're doing. Um, and then there's certain aspects of the audio engineering side and the, the music theory side that you have to understand as well with making loops, loop based songs. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of what I'm into. Um, one thing that I would like to share with you is an example of the sandbox symphony and how those things come together because as my artists practice uh bringing these things together is important and i'm going to share a document youtube let's see here here we go so we can chat about it you got my screen there yep I'm sorry, I'm trying to expand it for you. 
So the way it works with Sandbox Symphony, and I'm going to unshare my screen. So the way it works with Sandbox Symphony, uh, it's art activation in this area here of uh, North Kenwood, you know, uh, and it was inspired by uh, a man named Milton Meisenberg who uh, made these wood totems and transformed vacant lots into places that uh you know we could respect and look at and admire for our neighborhood you know these lots that had abandoned cars you know uh trash and you know drug paraphernalia and things of that nature uh changed the vibe you know with art it just immediately changed when we cleaned up these lots we carved these totems we uh dressed it up you know planted flowers and the way people responded to it were totally different, you know. Um, and that was kind of my first experience with someone changing uh, space, transforming space. And I'm very interested in this thing. And part of my artistic practice has adapted that as well. You know, this guy, Milton Meisenberg, was, you know, what they call a social practice artist, as well as a sculptor before, you know, people start using the term social practice because what he would do, his art engaged people to rally around these things to make them think about their environment differently. And uh, so that's some of the things that I like to approach with the young people. And going back to this whole loop based activity over the summer that we've been doing because you know everything is virtual now. Uh, is to really utilize the sounds of the environment. You know, um, we've also taken it a, a, a step further. There's a visual aspect to this course um, that <clears throat> we repurpose, you know, trash and things that you would normally throw away to make sculpture. Um, and how we're showing these things this year, we transform Sandbox Symphony to a virtual festival. So the students' work will be featured on a live stream that we'll be, you know, uh, sharing uh, across the World Wide Web. Um, it'll be streamed from the Chicago Park District. Um, I'm sure Cape will carry it. Uh, it'll be streamed on the Deep Banks website. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to say that my students are very integral in this experience, uh, not only because they live in a neighborhood, but because, you know, we build out these things that matter to them to us and i think that per engaging in that capacity i think is very powerful because you know what is learned is how one really has mastery of their environments and sometimes we just don't realize how much control we have within our immediate environments and how much power we have with art you know also it's important to see artists who are professional, who make a living with their art, who are, you know, active, uh, you know, citizens and, 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 and people who give back to the community uh, so that we can share in this idea of creating, you know, a new legacies, new history, you know, new narratives. So um, now, I spoke a little bit about what we were doing before pandemic and now what we're doing during the pandemic. Um, but I, I want to say going toward the future, I believe that some of these things should be adopted uh, in our practice, you know, 
And one of the challenges of really like streaming and having virtual lessons and content is it's the engagement factor. And so I challenge myself, my students to make things as physical as possible. I think that, um, you know, just like the Jazz Institute is doing this wonderful thing of actually bringing the physicality of playing still virtually, you know, uh, is a wonderful thing. And actually continuing to put together projects that uh, take form and have a life outside of the, the course, outside of the program. So when you put out a song, it exists as a, a record. You know, people can listen to it for years to come. It could be shared, it could be talked about, it could be included in movies. It could, you know, you get credit, you know, professionally, you know, with arts, organ, arts rights organizations like ASCAP and, you know, BMI and different things of that nature. This is a trackable record. It becomes something that you can utilize for college applications and different, different things, many things. But the idea is um, transforming space. And that was what I wanted to speak to you about today. All right. Thank you so much, Lionel. Appreciate your contribution here. And uh, we're going to come back to some of those ideas in the conversation. Awesome. Uh, one, one quick uh, comment. Uh, the Sandbox Symphony will be streaming August the 8th. Uh, so that's, you know, next week. And uh, I hope that uh, we'll have some of our viewers here tuning on in and, and being actively engaged with the physicalities of this virtual space that we've created. You'll be amazed at what the students have done. Can you send uh, the, could you put a link to information about Sandbox Symphony in the, in the chat box as well? Yes, yes, I will. And that video you saw, that's all our art. And some of some professional artists have, you know, had, we've intermingled, you know, the youth art with some professional art so that they can really see how their things stand up, you know. So there it goes. Cool. All right. Thanks, Lionel. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure we got time for our next speakers. Uh, Jordan Connect is our next presenter. Jordan is a interdisciplinary artist and um, also works with CAPE, but has worked uh, for many years in Colorado. And Jordan, I think in the introduction, I might have said John Connect, so I apologize. I think I was having a flashback because I actually- It's like you just, you compressed my name. It's, yeah, I, yeah. it's just like a nickname now. Funny side note, I actually used to work as when I was a full-time musician, I worked with a drummer named John Connect. So it was probably a Freudian thing. <laughs> Matt, take it away. Thank you so much, Jordan. Absolutely. Thanks, uh, thanks, Joseph. Thank you, Brother L. Thank you, John, for presenting. That was really inspirational. Um, I'm going to present my screen now, and we'll get going. I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes, um, introduce a little bit about the past of what I've been doing and a little bit about the present what we're doing, thinking about going towards the future. So my name is Jordan Connect. Like uh, Joseph said, multidisciplinary artist. I'm a musician, grew up with music in the home. I've uh, been playing music my whole life. Fun fact, my dad is also a recording engineer. So I grew up in a recording studio. I teach digital arts at a really beautiful school in South Shore, Chicago called New Sullivan Elementary. And every year we have these different guiding things that are taking us through what we are learning. I'm not necessarily a music teacher, but music is always integrated into whatever I'm doing in any class. Even if it's strictly visual art, I'm gonna find a way to squeeze music in there just because I think all of the stuff is interconnected. This year in my class for the summer program, we're thinking about the question, how do we use digital arts and technology to communicate? Because that's our main mode of interacting with each other. So we're thinking about how to really go ahead and take hold of that. A thing that we think about often in my digital arts classes, both how do we use technology, but how does technology use us? How are the ways that technology actually can hinder us rather than help us? In learning about anything, really anything at all, we lead from inquiry. That's something that I do in my own practice. That's something that CAPE does. I'm a teaching artist through CAPE, maybe or maybe I didn't mention that. Um, but we're looking at inquiring in a lot of different directions, looking historically, looking culturally, sociologically, aesthetically, intuitively, 
scientifically, most importantly, interconnectedly and tangentially. So looking in all directions, following those things that maybe feel like they're not quite related and following, finding the ways that so many things are interconnected in ways that are initially invisible or imperceptible. I deeply believe that you can learn about pretty much anything through music. So that's one reason I bring music in because music is heavy, music is dense. When I pick up this Curtis Mayfield record, there's so much that we can learn from it. Based graphic design, the design is sick. We can learn about the history of where this music comes from, where Curtis Mayfield grew up. When I teach Curtis Mayfield in Chicago, it's because Curtis Mayfield had so much of his history in Chicago. Learning about Curtis Mayfield's music, you're also gonna learn about the Great Depression, or sorry, the Great Migration, very opposite. Um, you're gonna learn about history of music publishing. You're gonna learn that Curtis Mayfield wrote thousands of songs that people in all areas of the entire world have played and have adapted. So just from Curtis Mayfield, we're taken around the world, we're taken around the United States multiple times. We're also taken through a lot of different creative mediums. When I say that you can learn music to, or you can use music to learn just about anything, I sincerely believe it. This is a program that we have used multiple times in class. It is a free program that's on iOS. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of a barrier in, to entry because it's not available to everyone, um, only to Apple users. But this is using Euclidean geometry on concentric circles as a way to conceptualize rhythm and melody. It has low barrier to entry for use in that you don't have to know about music. You can start just clicking and making shapes and intuitively seeing the relation. What happens is as this ticker goes around the circles on the outside, it hits these little circles. So you've got concentric circles, I guess we could call these dots. So as you go around, it hits the dots and each concentric circle has a different instrument. So you can start layering, you can see the interconnected nature, but we can start learning about ratios. We can start learning about geometry. We can also learn about graphic design through this while we're making really amazing beats, while we're making really amazing melodies. Um, another cool thing is that it's fully customizable so you can add your own samples in there. So we have students who are recording things and then adding their own recordings so that they can start figuring out how to sample their own sounds. This is Joey Joseph, um, our moderator and one of our students last summer as our student is teaching Joseph how this program works. I wanted to share a quick video. Maybe a little quiet, but the music that we're making on that is wily. It is out of control. It is way more complex than what we could be making if we're approaching from the front door. I like to think of this as approaching music from the back door maybe not understanding, but starting to understand intuitively through using. This is another way that we're looking at music about learning. This is a program, a project I did a while ago with some third graders in Denver, Colorado, where they interviewed their families about where they identified as being from. Then we took music from those locations. We listened to them together as a group and we went through a standardized arts curriculum, thinking about different materials, different modes of making, look at different artists, and we were all responding to music from every other student's uh, cultural background. This turned into this gigantic wall where we accumulated everything and people were able to come in. The wall functioned as the speaker. So it played the entire playlist of all the music we were listening to from Sudan, Pakistan, from Nigeria, from Germany, all over the world. And a really beautiful thing that the students were thinking about, these third graders were saying, when we're thinking about immigration, thinking about deportation and identity, walls can keep us out, but they can also let us in. So that was another way that we're using music to learn about just about anything. We're using music in the classroom. This is my digital arts classroom at New Sullivan. And even though it's a digital arts classroom, I am bringing records in constantly. Records are a really big part, partially because as a CPS contractor, I am uh, usually censored from playing YouTube and Spotify doesn't work on their Wi-Fi. So records are one of the only ways I can get a lot of music in um, just from a technological standpoint. But it also teaches us more about the history of where our music is coming from. And the packaging on records is huge. So that's also a big uh, draw for us. 
as we're looking in multiple directions. This is from our digital arts class. We're listening to records, we're making our own music on computers, but we're also designing our own record covers. So this is some of the record covers that students were making while we were working together in class. So everything is included in music. If you open your mind enough, you can start learning about all this stuff, historical stuff, cultural stuff, aesthetic stuff, intuitive stuff, sociological stuff, all this great stuff. To the present day, we're still thinking in our digital arts summer school, which is all digital now. So no matter what we're doing digital stuff, even if we're listening to records, we're still thinking about how do we use digital arts and technology to communicate? Music is an amazing form of communication. It communicates pre-linguistically and also post-linguistically. So it is affecting us in so many different ways. But also the idea of this technology can include my pen, it can include an ice cream scoop, it can include the laptop that I'm speaking to you on. It's a really broad thing, so we can encapsulate a lot of stuff in there. I believe not only that we can learn about almost anything, pretty much everything through music, but we can also learn about pretty much anything through anything. Um, I know it's a kind of out there broad thing, but I really deeply believe that if you open your mind enough while you're exploring stuff and you think tangentially enough and broadly enough that you can start finding all of these connections. And there's so much potential to learn from absolutely everything. As we were preparing for this summer school, I liked, I know that the school is amazing about giving laptops to kids in or out of school. So I was hoping that we'd get some of these free programs, doing some uh, graphic design on this online program called Pixlr that is free to use. That's basically the equivalent of Photoshop. It's really neat. I was hoping that we would download Audacity, which is a really basic but functional music editing program, audio editing program. I was also thinking we were going to be working on Scratch, which is a coding program. And with Scratch, it's really great because you can code music. You can actually start doing a lot of the beat-based stuff through coding. So that can be a really great access point to learning about coding through music, also through graphic design, through storytelling. But in planning all this, we have this emoji sad face because Students may have gotten these amazing resources of computers, but maybe the programs are on them. Even if they have the computers, some students are using Apple, some are using Windows, some are using Chromebooks, some are using their phones. So there's no way to get the same programs for all these folks, which means we have to adapt, we have to grow. So some of the programs that we're thinking about, like Audacity, turn into this program called Beatbox, which is a sequencer program where this bar goes from left to right and you can start to click um, and add different instruments. There's different layers. So as we're adding layers, we can actually think about graphic design because there's a lot of layers used in graphic design. As we're thinking about things moving left to right, we can also think about the ways that we're parsing on the screen. Down here, we're no longer using Scratch just because it's less easy to be doing that translating from phones to computers and all this, but we can use this pixel art program. Pixlr surprisingly has actually been pretty all right to use across platforms, or at least so far the students have said so, but we've adapted the programs we're using while we're working with a lot of different students. And within these, there's still a lot of interconnectedness. So we get online, we have all these programs um, that we've got ready. When I'm looking at programs, computer programs, applications that we're using with students. I want them to be no cost to students because I don't want anyone to be inhibited from learning anything based on the money they have. I don't want anyone to be inhibited based on the resources they have, access to information and knowledge and to sharing and to inspiration. So that was another thing that goes into these programs, which is one reason we chose them, that we really love them. Something we noticed immediately as we're getting together on Google Meets is that we're able to use YouTube, which is really amazing. Students start sharing music frequently. We start just sharing stuff. One of our students, we play Prince Royce all the time. One of our students is obsessed with Prince Royce. Another student is obsessed with BTS. So through this, we're just sharing music, kind of getting to know each other, just on a casual way, not going into any kind of theory or anything, 
But all of a sudden in the chat, I noticed that Korean starts showing up. We don't have any Korean kids in the class. We don't have any kids who know Korean, but all of a sudden because of Google Translate, we're able to type in Korean to each other. We're able to type in Yoruba to each other and start learning about different languages from all over the world. And that got us talking a lot about food because I love Korean food. So I got to share duck bokeh and we talked about our favorite foods. And our teacher was like, oh, you know what? We're gonna, we should, work together and we should have students cooking each other's favorite foods at home. But quickly we realized right now, a lot of parents are really, really busy. So it's hard to nail them down to get them to cook. Some students don't feel safe about using fire and stuff at home. So we were like, okay, that's a little sketchy, but we can figure this out. And really quickly we were like, what do kids like? We're working fifth graders. Kids love ice cream. So all of a sudden our songs become ice cream songs and everything, we're like, okay, this class is now a digital ice cream class. If loving you was ice cream. So we got ice cream all over the place, decided we we're gonna look at everything through ice cream. Dynamics love ice cream, Beyonce loves ice cream, Johnny Osborne from Jamaica loves ice cream. This is one of our students who has taken the graphic design element and taken their love for BTS and made a BTS Sunday using that Pixlr program. We're looking at all these different things through ice cream, but also, I mean, while we're doing all this different stuff with the graphic design, one thing that is inherent in ice cream is the jingle. If you don't have the jingle, then no one's gonna run out of their house. One thing that we found online is this amazing clip. Someone edited Eddie Murphy, so he's kid friendly, which is, kind of miraculous and they made it into a cartoon. So Eddie Murphy's ice cream skit, we were able to share. If you haven't seen it, I'm not gonna share it right now. It's pretty long. Um, if you have kids, do not share the unedited version. It is not school friendly, but it's amazing. Um, we started sending home kits once a week. So we're talking about all things related to ice cream. Ice cream leads to social justice because all these different people are using their platform. Like Ben and Jerry's surprisingly using their platform for social justice talking with ice cream. We're sending home kits, so we're sharing inspiration of flavor and all this stuff. We're thinking about communication still, and we're thinking about what makes that brand, if we're gonna make our own ice cream, we're gonna make our own jingle, we're gonna make our own logos, what makes that iconic? So we started looking at hieroglyphs. We started looking at hieroglyphs because we're looking at language, how to communicate. We're already thinking about Korean characters and being like, oh, there's a kind of pictographic. We're also thinking backwards from emojis because we're using emojis constantly in class and seeing this connection between the two. It turns out that the early emojis and emoticons are wildly similar to these hieroglyphs from 3200 BC. So we're learning historically about all this stuff. But if you remember on that beatbox program, this is a grid. So all of a sudden we can look at hieroglyphs and we can say, how can we make this hieroglyph sound? So we can put it on beatbox and we can start taking iconography and making music out of it, thinking about how to translate things uh, through trans medium, transdisciplinary practices. Last thing I'm gonna share is that we started collaborating because you can actually send links of these beatbox programs and start working together. So this is one of the jingles that the students made for the ice cream, which is extraordinary com extraordinarily complex way more than if we had come through the front door of music. Coming through the back door, this is almost like Steve Reich or something. So we've got some really complex music stuff going on. We're still looking at all these different inquiry methods. And I wanted to leave you with this thing that we have in the chat, which is even though a lot of our students have not actually tried Starbucks, we have at New Sullivan waged war on Starbucks. Starbucks, we're coming from you with our ice cream brands. We are going to take down the competition. And as our teacher says on the bottom, New Sullivan always comes out on top. Excellent, thank you so much, Jordan. <laughs> and yes, yes to ice cream, yes. <laughs> There's nothing but affirmation. Excellent. All right. I um, want to call up our next speaker, who is Rachel Maxwell. 
Hello, hello. I'm so hungry now and I couldn't figure out why. But anywho, I'm approaching this from a more traditional um, setting of a large ensemble that's performance-based, say a school um, or community-based band, orchestra, choir. And I think a lot of the ideas I'm going to share out are applicable to all ages. Uh, we used it with our beginners who happen to be sixth graders, but could, this could all go younger. And through high school kids, um, it's pretty general about just our approach towards how do we transition the daily rehearsing into a model that would be meaningful for our kids and also um, sustainable to us because trying to move a class of say 70 kids online didn't really allow us to do a lot of live performance together. So I'm gonna share my screen out with you. And I did a, let's see here, I did a pre-record of mine. So hopefully I can get over here to it. It's hiding from me. Here we go. If you can't hear or see something, somebody hop on your um, microphone and let me know. A far southwest suburb. We have a fairly large program, about 1,100 kids in our building, and we have 400 in our band program. We start the kids in sixth grade as beginners, and then our choir program also has an additional 200, 250 kids, depending on the year. We also offer general music, and we have a spring musical. I'm going to tell you about some things that worked for us when we shifted over to an online model, uh, some things we discovered that worked and didn't work, and some of our plans moving forward. First thing that we have to talk about is obviously teacher mindset. That was the biggest thing for us was just to come to grips with the fact that the way we had done things was not going to be happening. And um, this has been a mind shift for the summer as well since you know, we really had planned that we would be going back to school in person in the fall and more and more that's looking like that may not be happening. Right now our current district does have the plan for the kids to be going back on um, sort of a rotating block schedule so we would see the kids every other day live but that might be changing pretty soon because of all the concerns so we had to really shift our mindset and wrap our head around this and not fight it but kind of embrace and go with um, the more we resisted the more difficult it was for us to plan or try to do anything meaningful for our students um, so we decided we needed to embrace this and figure out a plan so how have we adapted instruction? The first thing we did was we had to determine our purpose and our goals while online because they would not fit what we had done live. You know, just that constant playing interaction, the coaching model of play, react, play, react, play, react. Um, it's much more difficult to do that online, as you probably know. But we want to make it clear that we still had a purpose and we still had goals while working online. We recommitted to the priority of relationships. We decided that our relationships with our kids and our band families would be what would be at the forefront of everything we did. And that would lead our decision making. And honestly, that's a takeaway that's going to stay with us going forward and um, has just helped us really reevaluate the why of what we're doing. And we've always had an emphasis on relationships with the kids and families, but this is even more of a pressing matter at this point and we feel like it's critical to make those connections with kids so when we do go back i think we're going to be stronger than ever for this we increased our flexibility um, sometimes you know we would be more flexible on what is the product being turned in but more than that we are more flexible of the process how do we get from point a to b kids had many paths that we made available for them so that um, everybody's not living the same life. Everyone doesn't have the same structure. Everyone doesn't have the same support. So we just figured out what's our end goal, what's our end game, and allow kids to have different choices and different routes that we would get there. We would support students when the home environment does not. Um, you know, people talk about inequities, and of course we do see those with equipment, um, technology, but the number one inequality that popped out to us during this time was parental attitude, which is even more than support. Uh, if the parents have an attitude that's positive toward the work being done, that they see it as a priority, that they understand that it's important, 
that is happening with the students. They're easy to work with then, students getting their stuff done, you know, maybe some reminders if things weren't getting done. But if a parent has an attitude that this is all a hassle and an inconvenience and just busy work, then that's pretty much what we we're seeing from the kids. So even going back to school, that's something we're going to keep in mind is that parental attitude, which then of course leads to parental support, is so critical in what the kids are bringing with them into either our online or our live environment. So for our purpose and goals, once we decided we needed to have that very clear, we set that out to the kids. So our plan during remote learning, we wrote this out, made it clear, sent it to everybody. Our purpose is to develop relationships and the individual skills to allow us to continue individual student and ensemble success. Every time we made a decision about the work we were doing or how we were interacting with kids and parents, we would go back to this number one priority. We believe strongly that daily work has value. Our plan will continue to, and it did ask students to play their instruments each day. This helps to establish a daily routine and plan. We each need purpose and our mental health will thrive with some structure. We were trying to be very reasonable with this, but also since we have young students, it is so important the daily habit of muscle building, of embouchure development, of revisiting concepts and ideas and symbols so that those are clearly being ingrained and they become more automatic for them. Just like young students need to read every day. We felt playing, getting the horn on the face daily was important. We wanted the daily work to be very reasonable to fit into the new environment we had. So daily work should take approximately 15 minutes to complete. This was 15 minutes of the student time on their own. Moving forward, we're going to be meeting with the kids live in time. If we do go remote, we'll have like a live one hour class at the same time every day. So some of the work will take place in class together and then a few things will be on their own, but not daily work on their own if they're already meeting with us. We want a lot of that completed during their time with us. We really wanted to offer high and low tech solutions. So for instance, if we were collecting recordings from the students, all of our students were equipped with smart music and had a device. Our school district helped us make sure of that. And we also used band boosters um, to help share out some of our iPads and things we had for in-class instruction we loaned out. And all those kids had a smart music account. We also utilized Flipgrid. So if somebody had difficulty with smart music, we'd say, all right, hop on Flipgrid. There's a folder there for this week's work. Just make a quick video and send it in. If that didn't work, we also set up a Google voice number. And we said, send us a voicemail of your recording. Just say, hi, this is Josh Johnson. I'm doing number 34 and just play it for us in the voicemail. That's easy enough. Or even if you play it and the recording won't submit or your tech goes down, take a screenshot for us and send it to us. Um, like I said, the goal was that kids were accountable, had a routine, were trying to make progress towards something. And so as long as they were communicating with us and we could see that they had attempted and spent a reasonable time working on things, we could give them some feedback and help them move to the next step. We also wanted to provide additional support as needed. So beyond our designated class meeting times, we made it very clear to kids that we would support small groups or individual life coaching ses sessions. We made many appointments with kids for like 20 minute one-on-one -on -one private lessons remotely. They get stuck, they get frustrated, their parents would reach out or we'd reach out to them and find out they're overwhelmed. Okay, let's what, tell me a time. Let's see if that works for me. All right, it does, let's meet. And so we had a handful of kids that did that on a regular basis. We had several kids that we did a one or two time to help them get over a hump. And then we would offer coaching for small groups. We'd say, um, we're gonna be working on anybody who has solo five at uh, three o'clock Friday afternoon. It doesn't conflict with your other classes. If anybody wants to get on and get some coaching, we'll be there to help. Each day we made videos attached to the assignments of us modeling and playing through and explaining our thought process as we worked on the etudes and assignments. And we always made sure we say to the kids, did you watch the video yet? If they were stumped and mostly they didn't. So if we'd encourage them to watch the video, that solved a lot of issues. 
we really wanted to emphasize the culture. Now is the time to support each other. You know, we talk a lot about band being a family or our group being like a family. We have each other's back. Now is the time to, to walk the talk. So we took that to heart and took it very seriously. We also encouraged all of our kids to participate when we had line, online meetings together. We said, we want to see your face, even if um, you're wearing your pajamas or you're crashed out on the floor and out with a pillow, whatever, we want to see you, be with us. We also built in a lot of fun activities and we really hope that those were as important to the kids in the spring as the skill building. We will continue to emphasize those because that group participation and that group culture is one of the things that makes ensembles and music such a great thing and why it appeals to so many people is the connection of doing something together. We were very concerned about social emotional support, of course, because we want the kids to stay mentally healthy. Adults were struggling this with us, so of course our kids were as well. This message went out to our kids. It was posted on our website, on our Facebook, uh, texted out. If you need anything, get in touch with us. We're not together in the same room, but we're still gonna take care of each other. We set up a Google Voice account. Kids can text or call that number. And so that way I would get a little uh, alert message on my cell phone that I had a message in my Google Voice, I'd go to that and I would receive it when I opened the app, receive a text or a call, and then I could handle it um, at a time that was convenient for me without giving the kids my cell number. Although I will say on the side, they mostly do have my cell number from uh, traveling and trips, so I don't get too fussy about that. Um, and for the most part, nobody's really messed with me because I always tell them, if you mess with me, I invented, you know, TPing and pizza orders, so good luck. Anyway, going on, we also did a, a survey with our families early on. Let me show you this. Trauber Band Family Outreach. Do you have a child who could use a pick-me-up or extra encouragement, a birthday coming up during remote learning? You'd like to do something special for those kids who need some connection, quick phone call, video, drop a note, drop a card off, whatever to make their birthday or feel a little less lonely. And we had the parents fill that out. And then I would sort the spreadsheet I received from that. I would sort that out um, by the date of the event coming up that the student was missing, say their birthday. And then that week I would look and I'd send out either like a jib jab with myself and the other director being ridiculous sending a birthday greeting, or I would send them a special email or I put an announcement on our uh, Google Classroom, hey, here's this week's birthdays. Let's do a shout out to them. We also did some birthday drive-bys because we live in the area where we teach. And um, we had some kids who just needed someone to reach out. So we'd be like, hey, let's do a quick video call, see how things are going. Tell me about your dog, you know, whatever. Tell me about school, what's happening. And we always made sure parents knew we were going to do this. And, you know, for the kids who did it, it meant a lot to them and it just helped Parents feel like they had one more way to communicate with us what the kids' needs were. Uh, as far as what the daily work was, we wanted to make sure no, there were no surprises so that people could plan out the week. So on Friday, I would send out the work for the week coming up and I would show the whole week and we would send out multiple platforms. We have a newsletter in our Google Classroom. We'd load the assignments in smart music. But we made sure each day we include a social emotional activity that would tap into um, just some reflection, some things they could do to help others, something to just get outside of the computer in their head. We also included enrichment activity links that they could go in a little bit deeper. It included links to online music games, videos, websites that were fun, uh, recordings, that sort of thing. Not required, but there if the kids want it. And then we would do a warm up or scale, a rhythm set, and a one or two line etude. And then we also added some sight reading at the end of that, which the kids actually ended up liking quite a bit. So here's an example of daily assignment. So on this day, Tuesday, April 4th, creative project, it's Talent Tuesday, describe or demonstrate a talent on Flipgrid, family and pets can participate. They had some funny ones. Enrichment, uh, music lab, Chrome experiments. So that way they could mess around on that. And then you can see page 43, the F major scale on the Peggio, a rhythm set, exercise and a reminder that their solos were due. We did the solos in Flipgrid, by the way. Here's another one that just shows some of the things we did. He's so social, emotional, do something today to make another family member's life easier. And then we would ask the kids in Google Classroom, 
share with us what you did. And we saw some really neat things. During our live online meetings, we'd uh, have the link shared out through Google Classroom. And then we'd ask the kids to have their instruments ready to go, have their smart music open, and then use their phone or a second device to be um, on the meeting with earbuds. And we would kind of uh, share a screen of smart music. They'd look at their own. We kind of messed with that and got it working. And, but we'd always say to the kids, if tech isn't working, that's not the important part. The important part was we want you on here to see the information, to share with us, get feedback. And you can use this later when you do your work. Here's some ideas of culture building that we did. Um, just clear and consistent communication, purposeful work and activities, and flexible uh, flexibility, those things went a long way with our relationship with parents and the attitude towards the music program during that time. Um, we did not want to be a hassle and we did not want to be a blow off. So those helped immensely. But some other things that we did, Kahoot games are great to play remotely. We did funny flip grids. Mr. Johnson, the other director, myself made a TikTok teacher account. It was just, it's dreadful, but the kids thought it was funny. Uh, we did trivia night, different family activities. Jib jab videos, online birthday parties, or we had an online band party, birthday shout outs, etc. So you can take a look at this band meme contest. That's a good one. Um, so hopefully this will give you some ideas going forward, but less is more with content and the emphasis on getting to know the kids, giving them an outlet to express themselves and to connect and to be seen and heard is really where it's at. And We'll catch up on technique, we'll catch up on uh, instrument chops, all that stuff, but those relationships, um, if we lose them now, we're not connecting with them. So our number one goal is relationships and connections and supporting our kids. All right, hopefully this is helpful and we'll talk more in our live meeting. All right. Okay, on to your next. Thank so much, Rachel. Really appreciate it. And I and everybody may be or you may be aware that we're running a little short on time. Um, but uh, if whoever is up for it, I would like to stay a little late uh, to continue the conversation. So if you're able to, please do stay on after um, we have our folks from the CYSO. Um, Ann and Carrie, please come on uh, and present and we will continue the conversation after that. Thanks so much. Great, thanks so much. Um, my name is Karen Mari. I'm the Community and Family Engagement Coordinator at Chicago Youth Symphony Orchestras. That's what CYSO stands for. Uh, and my colleague, Anne, is just getting our presentation set up here. Anne is our Assistant Director of String Ensembles. Uh, she's also a public school teacher, so she's gonna have some um, really hands-on tips to share with you guys. Um, Anne, do you wanna say anything about yourself in an introduction? Um, sure. Uh, so I teach um, in a public school five, six uh, beginning strings. Um, so a slightly different world than Rachel, um, but similar population of students. And I also work uh, at CY. So my groups are kindergarten through third grade and fourth through eighth grade groups. So those are kind of my, my areas of expertise and some of the things, the examples that we're sharing today are going to be things that I used with either my groups at school or my groups at CYSO. Thanks, Dan. If we move to the next slide, um, really quickly, just for those who are unfamiliar, I know we've got folks from all over the state and country, which is really exciting. Um, in introduction, Chicago Youth Symphony Orchestras, we're, we are a nonprofit community music organization. We serve uh, about 650 students on site uh, in this building on the side of the screen. That's our building on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. Um, we've got seven orchestras, four steel pan ensembles, and a jazz ensemble. Uh, we also have some partnerships in Chicago Public Schools, and we serve about 8,000 students a year through education concerts in those schools uh, and in our, in our building uh, downtown. Uh, and do we want to move on to the next slide? It's frozen for me, so uh -oh. it will click in just a second. <laughs> of course, when you want it to go one, it goes three, right? <laughs> there we go. 
All right, so just so you all understand where we're coming from, before uh, the disruption that we all experienced due to COVID-19, we had six plus hours of rehearsals on both Saturdays and Sundays. We were seeing uh, 300 plus students each of those days. Uh, and then our groups range in size from about 20 to 130. So that means we're seeing um, small ensembles like Anne's Overture Strings group that have 20, 25 kids in them. Uh, we'll have steel pan ensembles with only 10 or 20 kids in them. And then we have something like a full orchestra of high school students with 130 kids. Um, we that's what we do on site. And we also have a lot of concerts because we have so many ensembles. We also produce a lot of concerts. Um, so we were, um, we were having a lot of concerts both for our ensembles and also in partnership with Chicago Public Schools, again, both in our space and in, um, in schools. So that's where we're coming from. Next, we'll talk about how we've adjusted and here's where all the good tips and tricks come in. Yeah, you can move just one slide. Um, so one of the main adjustments that we made is instead of seeing students in person, we kind of moved our main hub to Google Classrooms. And so that was a wonderful way for us to communicate with students, share resources with them. Um, I know there's various number of programs that can be used. Um, my school uses Schoology, but they're great for allowing students to be in constant communication with you, ask questions, create discussions, um, and, and just a great resource. So that was kind of our main, main thing that we were using. Um, with kind of exercises and activities, we call them activities with our students. Um, one of the main things that my priority was, was helping them identify problems problem sections within their music and practice strategies to tackle them. Um, I think one of the wonderful things about teaching is we have a whole list of different strategies that we can give students um, when we're in front of them. Okay, try this, try that. Um, but when they go home, they need to have some sort of repertoire that they can use that is their own list of practice strategies. So one of my favorite activities is this um, activity that asks students to pick a target section. And then thinking about within that target section, they have their challenger that we call it. Um, and so that could be rhythm, note reading, technique, or tone quality. And they kind of have funny names just to give it a, add a little bit of fun to the exercise. And so within that, students can read through some different strategies that will help them as they're tackling different aspects of the music and get ideas as they're practicing. Um, and one of the things that I like to do with this activity is they go through, they choose their section, their practice strategies. And then afterwards the, is a reflection so that students can think about, well, did that work well? Did it help me? How much have I progressed? Are there still challenges that I faced? So while I was working on rhythm, I realized that, oh my gosh, I can't move my bow fast enough in order to get this string crossing. And so things that as they're working through the music, they're thinking about what strategies work really well for them and how they can continue to improve as they, um, as they continue to work on the music. Let's see if I can switch slides. Fingers crossed it will switch for me. <laughs> um, the other thing is kind of the idea of taking home your music teacher. Um, there's a lot of great resources to make videos and um, practice recordings and things. And one of the things that I like to do with my students is create reference recordings. And one of my main goals with that is to get them to have kind of an inner speak as they practice. So things that will help them with transitions for my violinists, as you can see in this excerpt, um, they have to transition from low to C natural to C sharp high to. So reminding them about things like that, bowings, um, and also areas where they can work through um, ensemble playing. So if you look in this excerpt, the last measure that this, the students play here on beats one and three, the cellos have two eighth notes. So you'll hear me kind of talk them through this. And what I really like about this is they can play it as many times as they need to. They can hear me saying those things that so that as they're practicing with the recording, it's kind of going into their brain. And then hopefully when they turn off that recording, they kind of have me still in their brain speaking to them as they're going through their music and reminding them of those important um, 
tricky areas as they play. So I'm going to play the reference recording that I have for you. One, two, ready, go. Single, And so what I'll usually do is make reference recordings for all of the pieces and I do each individual part so that a student can pick their piece and uh, any section that they want in their piece that they're struggling with. And then I'll layer them on top of each other so that they have an ensemble recording. And this gives them a really great opportunity to scaffold. And we talk about how they can do that with the reference recording. So first, play along with your own recording, get that to be really familiar. When you're feeling pretty comfortable with it, then grab, if you're a first violinist, grab the second violin part. Play with something that's got some similarities to you, but some differences. When you're feeling comfortable with that, go the next level, grab the cello part, something that's most of the time usually really different, or grab the entire ensemble so that you can play with the orchestra at home. Obviously, it's not the same exact um, experience as when you're playing in the same room, but it can kind of simulate that for the students. Um, having Google Classroom is a great opportunity for skill builders. Um, all of these programs are free um, ones that I've used. I know there's a wide variety of wonderful things. These are ones that I found that I liked. Um, this first one, band.school.nz, uh, was created by a youth orchestra in New Zealand. And it's really great. It's like four minutes of timed practice. And what I really love about this one for string players is it starts with each individual string. So you start with two notes, D and E. Okay, can you know, do you know which ones are D and E? Then we'll talk, it'll, we'll go through note names, fingerings, it will then expand, D, E, F sharp. And from there, it will then build in different strings. So it's a really great tool for students to, to build skills and help note reading become um, more routine for them. The rhythm trainer in the middle, I really like. It's a great way for them to practice tapping back different rhythms. It'll show them the rhythm, it'll play it for them. They then tap it back and it will give them feedback. Uh, notes will turn red if they're correct, in, sorry, incorrect and green if they're correct. Um, the only thing that I don't love about this one is 16th notes can be tricky. You kind of have to adjust the tempo on it. Um, and the last one that I've liked using with students is perfect ear. Um, it's really nice because it has a wide variety of things that students can do. It has staff training, rhythm training, interval training, and like kind of a theory overview. The only thing that I don't love about this one is there's lots of clicking. So these are ones that I found that have been helpful um, for building kids' skills as they are at home. Um, and you know, you can't be asking them as easily, well, what note is that? If it's an F sharp, what finger do you use? Um, and these are kind of good intermediaries. One of the new adjustments was we also moved to Zoom ensemble, call, uh, ensemble calls. And this was a great opportunity to bring in things that we didn't usually um, have the opportunity to do. So we brought in, we were able to bring in presenters from you know, around the world, from our local area, from other states. Um, I really liked working with my students on listening exercises. So getting them thinking about music and thinking about music vocabulary. So one of the things that I did with my students was we took Carnival of the Animals and I told them, okay, Carnival of the Animals, each movement is meant to depict a different animal. And that was all the information I gave them. I played it for them. And then we had this great conversation about things that the students were picking up on the music. Oh, I noticed it was really low. So I think then it's probably a big animal. And the things that they were picking up on with tone, timbre, pitch, um, were just wonderful in building that vocabulary. Um, and even if they didn't get, guess the right animal, they had fantastic ways of justifying why they thought a particular animal. Um, so connecting their experience with the music and then also just kind of opening up that idea of like, look, one of the wonderful things about music is I can listen to a piece and I can have an interpretation of it and you can listen to the same piece and you can have a different interpretation of it. And that's kind of a cool, um, cool thing that music provides us. Um, 
Another thing that I really like with, especially with my young students and my beginners, is the idea of silent ensemble. I love Zoom in that it lets us all be in the same room together, but it's not great for playing together. Um, but there are still ways that we can make it work so that we can all have our instruments and be playing in the same room together, um, even if I can't hear you. So what I would do with the students was have them all grab their instruments. Uh, we'd talk about a specific concept. Um, one of them was slurs and, and you know, lifts and bowings. And have all the students on mute, grab your instrument. I'm gonna play for you. So I'm gonna go F sharp, E, and I'm gonna play it with a slur. Watch me a couple of times, then you join in and see what I'm doing. And I can really easily assess what they're doing. Do they understand the concepts of slurs? Do they understand the concepts of retakes? Um, so even though we weren't able to perform live together, we could still be performing and I could still be assessing them, even if I have a hundred kids in my orchestra. I just flip through the page and I'm watching their bow. I'm watching their fingerings. Okay, they've got it or this kid doesn't have it. And then that gives you the opportunity to break it down into smaller groups and, and help those students that are struggling with the concept. Um, so this video is just a couple of things that you can see a, a brief overview of some of the things that we've done. Um, you know what, Anne, I think in the interest of time, um, I will just send a link to our YouTube page. And if anyone's interested in learning more about what we've done virtually, both in class and performances, you can visit it um, online just so that we, we get done in time. Sounds great to me. Um, the other awesome opportunity that COVID provided us was we can't have concerts like we usually do, which is unfortunate, but is also an opportunity for us to do different things with our performances. Um, all of our ensembles at CYSO and all of my um, ensembles at my public school were able to create virtual performances. And one of the things that I really love about virtual performances is you can really feature every single student. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that I have parents come up to me and say, well, it, it was a really great concert, but I really wish I could have seen my, my child. You know, it, the, awful thing about stages is you can really see that first front row of students and everyone else behind them is really hard to see. Um, so my goal with creating virtual performances was to showcase and highlight each student and also to bring in things that highlighted things that were important to them. So my students um, in Wilmette at, at my public school, they worked on a piece called Colors of Home. And one of the things that I did with this piece is we did the, the traditional you record and I'll put a clip of you playing. We did that, but I also asked them to bring, send me pictures of things that reminded them of home. So uh, things that were important to, to them that we could then share with our audience. So I got, you know, pictures of their pets, pictures of the tree outside of their window that they really like to climb on, you name it, there was a whole wide variety. And with each one, we got to learn a little bit more about things that were important to each of the students in the ensemble. Um, Karen, do you also want to link our Vivaldi performance or do you want me to play just a little short clip of it? It's super cute, so I think we should watch a little bit. All right, I'll show you a little bit. This, these are my Overture String students. They're playing a clip from uh, Vivaldi's Four Seasons, uh, and this is one of the things that they worked on during eLearn. <laughs> So those were some of the things that we did. We did, um, we had the opportunity to uh, create virtual performances for each of our ensembles and include a wide variety of our students. It was uh, a wonderful experience. Something that uh, Anne neglected to mention in her humility is that she actually put that video together herself, which is very, very impressive, I think. I learned a lot about editing. Um, I can say that from this COVID experience is I have learned how to use a lot of technology that I haven't before. <laughs> And, and we actually did have a question in the chat about which, which program you use to do that editing. Is oh, that something you remember? Um, so I actually used iMovie uh, and GarageBand for editing the audio. I don't know that I would recommend it. It is a little bit cumbersome in a process. Um, there are other things out there that are better, but that was just what I had the opportunity for. Um, with iMovie, unfortunately, you can only layer two videos at the same time. So you have to do a lot of exporting and re-importing. 
thanks. Um, all right, so in our last couple of moments here, I just wanted to uh, give everyone an idea of what CYSO as just one example of a community music organization is looking for next year, what our hopes for an uncertain future would be. So um, as of this moment, as we all know, things change every moment. Um, but as of right now, we are aiming for um, kind of a three tiered approach to programming that provides a flexible combination of virtual and hopefully in person instruction for students. Um, so the idea is that we'll be able to move back and forth between the three different tiers or lanes, um, depending on what is safest for students. Um, the kind of tier zero or tier one is all online learning. Tier two would be every other week, we would have small pods of students um, so that the kids are isolated and only seeing a small number of students and they also have a built in break. Um, and then the most, the most that we're hoping for this year is weekly small group rehearsals. Um, so that's kind of how we are approaching it and we can go back and forth between those three different tiers as things change. Um, we are pairing that with some new approaches to online learning uh, that Anne brought up. I think that as a community, we all are scrambling to try out all these new things. And so we're really excited to participate in conversations like this and bring some of the things that we've learned over the summer to our uh, online learning stuff to increase that value for students who will be having some virtual stuff, even if they have in-person stuff. Um, and then we also want to expand the range of topics um, about things that we don't always talk about in an orchestra setting. So things that Anne was um, talking about earlier, like the, um, the Four Seasons or the, sorry, the Carnival of the Animals, just having examples like that, that maybe you don't always have time for in a typical orchestra setting that's focused on notes and rhythms and, and that kind of stuff. So talking about ensemble ship and all those other good things that are part of an orchestra experience that we maybe don't always have time for. Um, and that's important to us because at the very bottom of the slide here um, is our mission. Yes, CYSO is about musical excellence, but we're also about personal excellence. And I think that um, it's very exciting to us to have the silver lining of being able to spend more time focusing on um, on the personal excellence part this year, in addition to all of our wonderful musical excellence. Uh, and what's the next slide? I think we've just about wrapped up. Yes, indeed. All right. If you have any questions about anything that we uh, talked about, you can visit us online at cyso.org, that's Chicago Youth Symphony Orchestra, cyso.org, or feel free to contact me directly. My email is here at the bottom of the screen, but I'll also pop it in the chat. I'm happy to connect you with any of the resources that we've mentioned. I'm happy to have conversations about anything that we've talked about um, because the way that we are gonna serve our students best is if we're all communicating and in this together. So thank you so much. Um, and I think we're gonna turn it over to Joseph. All right, thank Karen. Thank you, Karen and Ann so much. I really appreciate it. Been, these are great resources and ideas. Um, it's so exciting to see how, uh, what you've been able to develop over the past few months. Um, Definitely, um, I would say uh, for this moment we're in right now, this transition to this conversation, there were a lot of questions I noticed in the chat that were technical questions for the presenter. So if you were one of the presenters, please do uh, look through the chat um, as you go here. You probably have been watching it, but there were some very specific technical questions that I won't go into this conversational part, um, but you can email um, anybody at CAPE or um, or myself, Joseph, at capechicago.org for follow-up questions. We'll be posting this publicly online. And, um, and at the end, Jenny already posted a survey, but um, we'll pump that out again in the chat uh, before it's over. So for those of you who can stick around, um, please do. We'll, and that includes the presenters. I don't want to presume anybody doesn't have a pressing personal <laughs> issue that, that we set the time. So I understand completely. But if you can't stick around, I wanted to open up the dialogue a little bit. Um, across these different uh, presentation presenters, um, I wondered about um, something that kept coming about, um, coming up in your presentations about how, even though we're so distant, a lot of the curriculum and the projects and the work you've been doing has become even more personalized um, and personally relevant and how important that is in this remote setting. I wonder, 
you know, what are, what are you thinking? And this is, I'm going out to the presenters here, but feel free to respond to this question in, uh, in the chat too, if you have thoughts on this um, for everybody else. You know, what, how are you thinking about, um, you know, adjusting to making, to making these connections and personally relevance, uh, really relevant to each of your students? And what's, what are like um, ways that you want to explore that further in the future? So I can share one thing that we did with our students um, and in CYSO is um, I think it's a great opportunity to get to know each student individually and learn more about what um, music kind of makes them tick. Um, so one of the things that we did with our students uh, was we were as direct directors we've been sharing some of the music that we've been listening to um, that has kind of been inspiring us that we found interesting um, and we asked students to kind of share the same things with us and um, I in particular had been sharing a lot of the um, songs of comfort with my students so I asked them to share some of the things that they were listening to things that had comforted them um, and I got a wide variety of of pieces um, from classical to jazz, um, pop music. And it was just a really fun way for me to get to know the students um, even better. And we could connect through different types of music. I could learn about them. Um, a lot of students also brought pieces that were important to them culturally um, and were able to talk about that. And, and that was a unique experience that um, hopefully makes everything more relevant for the students and also um, makes it relevant for us as teachers. I'll piggyback off what Ann just said. Um, our first project we're going to do going back to the school year is um, personal soundtrack. And we're going to, you know, set up some parameters for it, but ask the kids if we had one CD album, whatever, however you want to call it, that would be the soundtrack for your life. What would you want it to be? And then from there, we're going to sort of guide them into picking a representative song of what can this tell us about you and what are you willing to share with us about the meaning of the song to you personally and it'd just be a really good way to um, get the kids to open up and have a little bit of a safety net maybe they don't want to necessarily verbalize or type or speak what's going on with them emotionally or personally but they would be willing to share it through a song um, which gives them a little bit of a like that safety that it's not them personally but yet they can share out so we're excited to see the results of that And I think there's there's a personal element to everything inherently because um, at least I th think from my end as a contractor, the amount of intimacy that I can have with students is limited by law. So I'm not allowed to contact students outside of class. I'm not allowed to really contact their families, but all of a sudden I'm in their homes. And so I think there's, it's unavoidable to a certain extent, which is is really nice because it there's, a sharing of intimacy that happens when we're together that's really beautiful and really important to feel that kind of comfort and safety with each other and then there's also another sharing of intimacy when a student is willing to turn on their camera for you and let you see inside of their home life and so that's not to be taken for granted but also if a student is opening themselves that way that can be an invitation to bring in more personal elements into the classroom and on that note as well, if you have a student that's shy about sharing their space, or it's not a space that they want to share, but they want to appear live with you, um, I know there's some add-ons for Google Classroom or Google Meets where you can have the kids put a background on. So if that's something that's a barrier to your kids uh, being online with you, uh, it's something to look into that might make them more comfortable as well. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I wanted to say um, and address the idea of, of being personal. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's so important um, it's to really approach what really matters to the individual. Uh, the subject matter, the material, um, and how they really feel it, you know, and interlock with it. Um, and I really enjoy this idea of a personal soundtrack. Um, in some ways, we approach this uh, with the sounds of the environment, not just the soundtrack that's been created, but 
creating uh, music, sound, art, through things that are in your own environment that are representative of you, you know? And I think that, you know, that really, that approach in some ways helps for engagement because it's you all the way. It's nobody else, you know? So just wanted to share that idea. Great, thank you. Um, I don't want to lose this in the chat. We had a, a direct question to the panel. Um, this is from Mary Beth. With respect to planning time, individual coaching, evaluating assessments, checking in with your kids, and trying to take care of yourself, which is important, how often do you plan on releasing digital concerts performances? How much time can you rationalize allocating to post-production? This is a good self-care question, but also kind of a technical question. Um, have you all had conversations about what's realistic in terms of your ability to be like a digital content producer alongside being a teacher and a human being? I, I, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, whoever is just, John. Oh, my bad, yeah, that was me. Uh, I, will, I will say it does get kind of hectic. Um, I know usually we feel like we work from nine to five during like five days a week, but since COVID, I'm pretty sure everybody has been feeling that we work seven days a week, mm -hmm. all, all day, all all day uh, it's it's a never-ending thing especially when you're a musician as well as an educator and then trying to come up with uh these concerts and things for the students as well as trying to figure out some some of your own intellectual and uh personal stuff to get out there as well with it it, it becomes I want to say like this, the one thing that we do preach to the student council kids a lot is about organization. Organization is key. Uh, and with organization, we can get everything together. Um, but with this COVID thing, what's, what's so nice about it is I, I, I felt that like, because we don't have to move as much as possible, as much as we used to, it frees it up a little bit, but then you tend to have to kind of slow down because you try to occupy everything in one small space because you're not moving around so much. And I was just gonna jump on and say that we made a, a, a decision that we were not gonna do a digital concert that we would have to splice and put together because we just did not have it in us. I'll be honest, the spring was pretty taxing. Uh, there's two of us and we have 400 band kids and it was very overwhelming. So we're definitely adjusting for that and um, we haven't we don't even know really what we're doing yet, so we haven't made any hard plans but I am not an, a video or sound editor in any stretch and that's just not something right now that I, I just feel like people should feel like if you don't do that it's okay because it's very flashy and you know administrators love it but I don't think they really understand that it's it's one tool of many that you can use for a connection and a meaningful uh, performance or experience for the kids. It's, it's one of many ways to do it. So if you're not putting together that giant ensemble, the Eric Whitaker sized you know, choir thing, I think that's okay because that's not in everyone's wheelhouse. So that's my two cents on that. But yeah. Anne on the other hand did a great job on it. So she's good at it. Anne could tell you firsthand what's involved. And that's, that's great. I'm actually, um, I just want to bounce off of that. Um, you know, just Kevin in the comments said, uh, interesting thing, you know, if you, if you have students that are interested and have the, you know, delegate that this may be a really cool student project, um, because they're, you know, they were, this is, uh, in their wheelhouse, maybe more than yours and could be an interesting, um, like, uh, like John, John, you were just saying, you know, like, this uh, learning about organizing, like how would you, how are we gonna organize a digital concert? You're in charge of it, I'll check in weekly. <laughs> um, but I think that's a great, you know, uh, thing to put forward is that, you know, instead of being, I have to do it and it's gotta be perfect and it's gotta be this way to see what students can do with that. Um, I wanted to pivot off this topic though to something else to ask the panel, which is, you know, this makes me think of, well, you know, in this context, and we might be in this for a while, um, you know, how is this challenging you to question your actual, like the core of your pedagogy with your work here? Because um, I feel like there are shifts in what everybody's doing. Um, so how do you lean into that? You know, what are ways that you're changing? I mean, I, I, 
was asking this question to artists and musicians. How is this changing your practice as a musician? Um, but definitely it connects to being a music educator. I'll say something. Uh, it has been it's been very um, interesting. I before this, I never really I had the tools, and when I was in college, I did a lot of uh, separate recording at home and everything. Um, but now, because we can't really play with each other, I've been finding out more and more tricks and uh, tips of how to like self record and then send that to interact with other people. So, uh, and I've been just trying to relate that to the students because just like what I, I played earlier where they're literally recording themselves play and then they send it to each other and then they build off of that. Um, the one thing that I really feel that we, uh, that's kind of weird about it is that you don't really have that person live there to kind of like edit it on the spot. So it's, it's, it's a little time consuming in the point where you're sending back tracks and everything and then uh, it, it kind of limits who can do it because if you don't, obviously, if you don't have the resources to do something like that, it's really hard as well uh, to get something like that done. But fortunately enough, a lot of the kids that's in the student council have iPhones. So <laughs> one way we've been getting around it is that they will hear what the track is and they'll actually take out their iPhone and then just record an audio clip. And then somebody who does have the resources uh, help them out and then they'll have a conversation between themselves and go through certain stuff and then maybe re-record re what needs to be done and add it, add it in. And sometimes they, they have a little bit more knowledge. Sometimes I've been seeing as far as like the production side is adding effects and stuff, all these different uh, engines and logic and different programs that I was just barely scraping the surface <laughs> and they can go a little bit deeper into it. And sometimes it's, it's been more, I've been having more of the, oh, teach me more about that. Uh, it's been more of like a a hand hand teaching moment uh, in this like new day age with uh, di digital audio workstations. Yeah, I wonder, you know, that coming from a jazz education perspective, you know, thinking about ways that digital music is starting to infiltrate the practice, right? And it's nothing new, you know. There's been the use of digital technology to make jazz recordings for a couple decades now. Right, uh, and actually integrated into the aesthetic is another thing that exactly. I'm, I'm aware of. I, I'm terrible with names, but I know there are jazz artists that are really into using electronics along with improvised. Right, yeah. and that was one thing that I think um, you see a lot more in, at a college level now because they're starting to really, they have like, like I went to new school and that was one of the main things that a lot of, a lot of, everybody in new school was uh, in their own like lane, but one thing that I can tell you about everybody at, at that school is that everybody had like a curiosity with technology and music, um, whether it been like uh, the stuff integrating uh, over overlays over the concert, over the music, integrating videos in the background. You saw a lot of stuff. Um, so that's where I first got the little spark of, oh, I can add this more to the experience of to my audience that I'm getting towards. It's all about creating content, not only for a digital sense, but as well as a, 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 in a live context, because it takes, it changes the tone of the whole music overall, when you have a visual uh, representation as well as the audio for it. Um, I'm curious to hear from Brother L on this topic, because I know you've done a lot of of your music um, in performance is based in improvisation via electronic instruments, but also via traditional instruments. Um, do you see this scenario of not being able to be in a social space with other musicians impacting the way you make music, or is it kind of doubling it down? Well, that's a really interesting question because I think that um, it's important for us to be with people and to connect with people uh, to do any art, you know, it's an expression. So, uh, and it's a way to communicate. So communicating by yourself is not that fun. Um, <clears throat> that's first and foremost. I actually think that technology um, can assist us in connecting better, actually. Um, 
you know, pre-COVID, there's a lot of technology in right now that we can connect, we can record, we can um, have these engaging conversations to build on things that we weren't really utilizing to the fullest capacity. And now, um, because of the push, we are all now more so media, um, <clears throat> more so me advocates of media, uh, you know, producers of content. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. I think that it pushes the envelope uh, so that, uh, you know, the future is definitely different. And, you know, this is not to take away from traditional music theory and, and skill and composition by any means. I think that all of these things need to coexist so that um, the enrichment and the um, stimulization can come uh, naturally in some ways. So, um, more specifically, you know, if we want to talk about programs and different um, uses, I'd be willing to uh, speak to anyone, you know, after this, because I know that we're under, we're pressed for time. Um, and there are some resources that I can share as well. So. Great. Um, <clears throat> one thing I speak um, to that real fast as oh, well. Yeah. Just thinking, I think um, I'm in a, an oddly unique situation as a person who's not actually on the hook to teach anything in particular. It's my privilege to be a, under the umbrella of digital arts and that um, I think there are a lot more expectations of of people who are in orchestras because you can't get away with not teaching someone how to use their instrument. It's just not okay. And it, you can't teach, like if you get done with your jazz camp and you don't know how to play, like you, you got worse at drums or something, then maybe they didn't do their service. But um, something that from a pedagogical standpoint is really of value. I was reading uh, Brother L mentioned that um, ownership is really important. And I fully agree. Um, at the same time, while we're being creative, while we are learning our tools, I think that authorship and ownership is actually something that we can obscure in a really potent and important way while we are learning those tools so that we don't have that preciousness of failing. And that's something that we can, we, there's a lot of sharing that we can do while we're online that what Brother L was saying, we haven't utilized those technologies as much. We took them for granted while we were in person. And now all of a sudden, my students are the teachers in class while they are presenting to all of us on Google Meets. And we are sharing the authorship and ownership of our own education, but also in all of the things where you, I used to have to get kids to get up and run to each other's computers to collaborate. And all of a sudden they can just click and send a file. And it's there, yeah, so there's ups and downs and there's a lot of beauty in that we are now learning to to harness that technology so that we can use it instead of it using us. Right, the ease of access I really feel in this new wave is there and just waiting for us to take advantage of it as everybody's saying. Great. Um, I have another question for the group. Um, I don't know if, you know, it's getting to almost 5.30, maybe we'll call it around 5.30, but I'm, I'm a little flexible Thing enough people doing um but um we are having a next our next public event our conversation next will be on, about family learning and about family engagement via the arts in this remote online scenario so we'll be sending out stuff about that so please do um fill out the survey and we'll post that could someone from cape um find the link to the survey to to put in the chat one more time because we do want to reach out to you all to invite you to that family learning um conversation we work with researchers and artists and teachers on that um, but I want to put that to the group you know what there's been a lot of talk of like uh, Rachel you put really eloquently like investing in the relationships it's about what happens after this we can actually come out of this with stronger relationships with students and families and I thought that was really powerful um, and so what are thoughts about how do you engage families how do they become a part of these projects um, what what would you like to do more in the future in terms of family learning? Well, we had our students do a solo recital and I was surprised at how many families were engaged with it. We didn't say they had to be, but many of them were the kids, you know, videographer, they'd set up a little audience and the kids got dressed up to do their, 
their solo. You know, some kids did them alone, of course, whatever they're comfortable with. But I think if we continue to encourage, you know, doing little performances for your family, um, having, uh, giving the parents a rubric in, in a positive way, like, uh, you know, the things that they do well, that they could acknowledge and have some vocabulary and some uh, terminology that they could use that would be meaningful to a, a music student. Because some of the parents will say, well, I don't have any music training. Well, here's a little guide on things that if you, if you like it, so if it sounds like this to you, here's the way to put it into music words. So they have a little training. Um, when we did our little flip grids of um, talent shows, and we also did like a, like sing your favorite song kind of thing, we had a lot of parents jump in on that. So I think the thing is to offer it as an option for parents to be involved, but not require it because we don't necessarily want it to be another stressor on their plate of things they have going on. Yeah, and that's the other side of the coin, right? Is that it's there's inherent challenges there. Yeah. Any other anybody else have thoughts about that? Um, I want to speak to the fact that uh, since we're in homes, everything is family now. You know, uh, our parents are peeping in, seeing what their young ones are doing. Uh, sometimes they they engage with me. Uh, and uh, a part of the program. Um, and I think that's actually a beautiful thing in so many ways, you know, it's very powerful. Um, yeah, and that didn't happen in, in the physical environment, you know, of, of, of schools, you know, so to speak, you know, your, your mom it wasn't looking over your shoulder trying to see what you were doing, you know, although teachers would like that, but it wasn't happening, <laughs> you know, so um, yeah. But yeah. on, on the flip side of that, it can be very difficult, too, because there is a lot of trauma that you, you witness as well and different things of that nature going on that could be problematic with the facilitation of, of some instruction. So it, it yeah, it's so many different things. Yeah. Um, to what Brother L said, it, it is because we're always doing stuff like this. We are in the home. Uh, at the Institute, we, before every single year, we have our uh, parent meeting. So that, that's where we got to meet some of the parents. Um, some of the parents actually who did not make the parent meeting, I was always in contact with them via phone, but now I can actually put a face to the name <laughs> versus getting text messages like, where do I have to pick up uh, Jill tonight? <laughs> um, and it's, it's kind of nice. Uh, it's really nice to keep in touch with them as far as uh, when I'm just having the student council. I, I know the first thing that we do before we even start the meeting is, how's everybody doing? Everything's okay. How's, how's your family doing? Tell everybody I said hi. Uh, keeping in touch and making sure that the parents know that we're always checking in on them as well as the kids, uh, the students that we have. Because our, our organization, we, we like to keep all of our people close, even our alumni, we check on our alumni a lot. Uh, and they always become a part of the family in the bigger long run. Um, and they feel that they can really trust us more. The more, the more and more we open up to them, the more and more they open up to us. And it, it's been a very powerful bond. Um, like I started with the Institute from when I was in third, no, fifth grade. And I went to college. Uh, the administration at the time was very loving and everything, and now I'm working there. Uh, it's a very family-oriented uh, organization, and we really take true in fostering the music throughout the city of Chicago. Yeah, I, I like that. And I like maybe this is a good place to leave off, just this idea that, you know, you are in, we are all in everybody's homes now. <laughs> you guys are in my home right now. And, um, so we're trying to engage with families, but also part of the work is building these artistic communities, you know, or you could say family or, you know, community. Um, and, you know, hopefully, like Rachel was saying, you know, these relationships are more important than ever in this context, which can be overwhelming. Um, and we're doing it through music, you know. So this has been really wonderful. I, I just don't want to leave without thanking again all presenters, Jordan and Rachel. I know they had to leave, but they did such a great job. Karen and Anne, John, Lionel, Brother L, thank you all so much for being a part of this. Thanks everybody for um, attending. Um, 
if you do get a chance to fill out the survey, it's very helpful to us in August. Best of, hold on, maybe frozen. Best of luck to all of you and all you're doing. Um, and feel free to contact uh, myself or anybody at CAPE uh, for further conversations. And we will be posting this all online as well. Thanks again. Have a great night, everybody. Peace.